Today's show is sponsored by Zeta Ventures, a venture capital firm that invests in early stage artificial intelligence first businesses. I met Ash Fontana at Zeta earlier this year and grew fascinated by his depth and breadth of understanding of the practical applications of artificial intelligence in business. I got excited about having him on the show, and Zeta offered to sponsor the interview as well. Stay tuned, and you'll soon understand why. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's first meeting is Ash Fontana, a managing director at Zeta Ventures, which is a venture capital firm that backs artificial intelligence companies with B2B business models. The firm invests in early stage companies with unique data sets and models and rolls up their sleeves to help founders by using a playbook Zeta created specifically for AI companies. Ash started his career as an entrepreneur and investor, and before joining Zeta, started and built the money side of AngelList alongside Naval Ravikant. Our conversation covers Ash's background, Zeta's thesis, team, and strategy, and turns to Zeta's sourcing, due diligence, decision-making, portfolio construction, working for portfolio companies, and investment examples. Along the way, we cover the evolution of AI, assessing data sets, misperceptions about AI, competing with the tech giants, and the future of investing in the space. Before we get going, you can sign up at CapitalAllocatorsPodcast.com to receive three different sources of information. Using the buttons on the homepage or the email list tab, You can receive an email from me once a month with the best things I've read and listened to over the month. While on that page, you can also sign up to receive our blog of industry news. Lastly, hop on the premium tab and subscribe to get access to the library of transcripts of podcast shows. Feel free to forward the emails you receive to friends to help spread the word. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. All opinions expressed by guests on the show are solely their own opinion and do not necessarily reflect those of their firm. Manager's appearance on the show does not constitute an endorsement or investment recommendation by TED or Capital Allocators. Please enjoy my first meeting with Ash Fontana from Zeta Ventures. Ash, great to see you. You too, Ted. Well, let's just start at the beginning. How did you first get interested in investing in technology? Yeah, it was funny. When I was a kid, I had these two peculiar interests that were completely unrelated. I liked pulling apart computers and there were parts strewn all over my bedroom floor. But I also liked pulling apart companies and the dinner table conversations were sort of things about accounting and collecting your debts and whatever else because my family are all entrepreneurs. And I had no idea how to turn this thing into a job. And then I read one day in a magazine, I was like 14 years old, I picked up some magazine in a doctor's office or something, and I read about this industry called venture capital, this was like in the 90s, and I thought, okay, that seems like it combines my interests, I'm going to do that. And (laughs) so I had step A and I had step Z, but I had none of the steps in between. And so I just thought, okay, well, maybe one day I have to move to the US, or maybe I have to learn a bit about investing and this and that. So... I went to law school because, you know, law is really useful (laughs) when you're doing deals. I studied finance and I actually, while I was at law school full-time, I was working for the global head of equity research at Macquarie full-time in the city. Luckily, my law school was three blocks from Macquarie. And so I got some investing experience. And then I was also just before college, actually, towards the end of high school, college, starting a few startups. So I was sort of doing all of these things and trying to piece this together, but I still didn't have 
that one step to get into venture. And then one day I just got a call to come to the US and got a job offer here, moved to New York and lived right near where we're sitting right now and worked here for a year or two. And then after doing that for a year or two, got the itch to start my own company again. And it all sort of snowballed from there. What were your early lessons from starting your own companies? We had a pretty wild ride with our company here that we started in New York because we started it and then sold it 18 months later. And so we went from, we did everything like built a team, built a product, raised money, signed some deals with some really big companies. What like was we, that company? It's called Top Guest. And so we helped really big travel companies manage their customer data. And so it's the start of this big data era, which sort of comes into play later now that I'm working on that again. And went from like start to finish in 18 months. And you know, a lot of lessons. I think the one thing that you take away from that or I took away from that that I apply to venture is not like this is how you hire your first salesperson or this is how you like integrate with this platform because all that knowledge changes. Best practice is always changing. The one thing you take away from it is just empathy for what it's like, like what it's like to show up to work and have absolutely no one care about your existence and have big companies think you're a joke and try to sell something and build something from nothing. And it is a very weird feeling to wake up every day with that as your starting point. And the founders I work for do that every day. And so there's just this like little bit of empathy I have for them from that experience. I think it's really valuable. Yeah. And what years was that? This was uh, 2009, 10, 11, 12. And so you sell the company. Yeah. And then what happens? So when you sell a company, some people reach out to you and say, what are you doing next? And one of those people that reached out to me was Naval Ravikant. And so he was an angel investor in the company because we used an early version of AngelList when it was still a mailing list, like an email list to raise a bit of money. So we used that in 2010. And he said, look, we're really busy at AngelList. Can you come and help? And I said, well, what does that mean? He's like, I don't know, just show up in the afternoon and just help. I've got all this stuff to do. Just help us out. I said, right, okay, sounds cool. And the minute I walked into the office, I just bonded with the team and saw a huge opportunity. So what was there when you just showed up? There were five engineers, a designer, and the founders. There were a couple of hundred investors that had been let in, had it been sort of manually approved. And there were a couple of thousand, to low tens of thousands of companies with profiles on the website. And it was sort of just a news feed, like this company is raising money now, or this company just added this advisor. It was sort of like a social network for this very small group of people. So that's what was there when I got there. We weren't a business. We didn't we weren't collecting money or whatever else. It was like a little social network for a small group of early stage investors in Silicon Valley. And then what? <laughs> and then what? Well, look, I saw the money and I also saw an opportunity to really work on what is my personal life goal, which is to help as many people as I possibly can work for themselves and just, just sort of manifest their destiny through their work and be their own boss, basically. And that was a huge opportunity at AngelList. So the first thing I sort of advocated for was let's open the floodgates a bit. We had all these people that had applied to use AngelList, but we were still manually approving them, curating them, whatever else. So we let in a couple of thousand investors. We let in a lot more companies. Then you have a curation problem. So I spun up a little team to curate the opportunities because as an investor going on there, you don't just want like a fire hose of startups. You want some startups that you know look good and have been analyzed and have a little summary. So I spun that up. And so then investors were starting to see real opportunities and make real connections to companies and then invest in those companies. So then the big step we took was creating an online investing platform. And so that involves a few things. One, you got to create products. And so I led the product team that made it such that you can basically click a button and invest in a startup online, sign all the legal docs, send all the money, all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of work there and I work with some phenomenal engineers and product people and designers and angelists on that. And so that was part one. Part two was, you know, what are they investing in? So you have to set up all these SPVs and run this fund management infrastructure that now manages thousands and thousands of funds. So setting up all the legal and accounting and fund management stuff, that was part two. And then part three was getting people to use it. And so that was convincing really high quality startups to raise a bit of their round online. That was convincing really high quality and high volume angel investors to start going online rather than the way they'd usually done it. 
and also VC funds and funder funds and all these other people. And part of that was actually we ended up raising our own funds to invest in these startups online and sort of quite systematically invest in these startups. So there was a lot of different components to that. But the summary is, you know, when I got there, we hadn't touched a dollar. And now Angelus manages billions of dollars online through this online investing platform. It's really cool. And so as you progressed, how did you decide when you were ready? Yeah, I wasn't ready to leave. Like I was having so much fun. I was helping people manifest their destiny to start their company and be their own boss. I was working with an incredible team of engineers and Angelus culture was so unique and so cool. And I was having a lot of fun as well because I had this like hybrid product investing role. I was managing a bunch of funds and working with Naval and whatnot on investment committees for those funds, but I was also getting to do a little bit of product work. I wasn't thinking about it, but I just sort of had this point of reflection and I was like, well, who am I as an investor? You know, I was an investor. I started becoming an investor and a technologist around the same time, like as a teenager. And who am I as an investor? And I thought, well, you know, what I really prefer in terms of how I build relationships with people is less relationships, but much deeper relationships. And what I really prefer in terms of how I analyze investment opportunities is a lot of fundamental deep research. I'm the furthest thing from a trader you can imagine. And I wasn't really doing that at AngelList. I was dealing with a lot of founders. I interacted with over 20,000 founders while I was there. And my my name and face were on all the messages that came out of AngelList for a couple of years there, which has very funny consequences today when I run into people on the street in San Francisco or founders just call email me saying, I'm raising money now and I remember you from AngelList and it was an automated message. So I wasn't really doing that at AngelList. I was having like high volume, low depth interactions and we were investing quite systematically and successfully, mind you, but quite systematically and based on all these signals that we'd computed rather than our own analysis. And so I just had this reflection about who I was as an investor. And at the same time, I met my partner, Mark, as just pure coincidence and had the opportunity to recalibrate and go back to more concentrated, fundamental investing where you build deep relationships with just a couple of founders. Okay. And so you and Mark decide to launch Zeta. And when was that? So we met in 2014. And when I met Mark, he'd already got it off the ground. So he had a very successful career in venture capital already. He'd been in it for over two decades at a, probably the best firm of the 90s, one of the best firms of the 90s. Which was that? It was Hummer Wimblad. And he'd already raised most of the funds, started investing and whatnot, but was keeping it pretty stealth. And we met and we just had this mind meld around like this next era of computing. And that is all systems, all software will become intelligent software. And after a bunch of conversations, we lived across the road from each other, so we'd catch up all the time. And after a bunch of conversations, it just like became really clear to me, like why would I invest in anything else? Like why would I bother investing in some consumer stuff or SaaS stuff or marketplaces, like all that stuff's great. There's a lot of opportunity to make a lot of money there, but this is a thesis on which you can build a multi-generational fund because this is going to play out over many decades, this shift to intelligent computing. Yeah, I'm really excited to dive into this whole world of AI with you. Before we do that, so it's you and Mark, Mm -hmm. and what does that team look like today? Oh, today it's not that much bigger. So we were lucky enough to meet our partner, Jocelyn, as we were sort of wrapping up the first fund and going into the second fund. And then we've hired some really phenomenal people over the years. We've hired a bunch of associates, Canoe, Ivy, Dylan, James, but it's the three partners and that team. And I think our team is quite obviously from the outside, very different and diverse. And that's because when we're hiring, our North Star is complementarity like we try to find people to bring onto the team that are as different to us as we can possibly manage culturally and the reason is like our job is to make good decisions and you make the best decisions when you've got the most perspectives around the table and so if you look at mark jocelyn and i we're totally different so firstly we're all operators as in we've all had operating experience but in different areas you know mark studied electrical engineering and actually helped build a lot of the power infrastructure in New York and then worked at Sun Microsystems and it was the Stanford AI lab. So that was his operating background. My operating background was much more on the product management side and business development side and doing deals with big companies. And then Jocelyn 
has been named objectively like one of the 50 most influential female engineers in the world. And she managed huge engineering teams at Facebook and VMware and whatever else. So our operating experience is all different. You know, generationally, we're all different. Our networks are all different. Mark is heavy in MIT. Jocelyn's born and raised in the Bay Area and went to Stanford. And my network's much more international. So we're just completely different, but it works. It works really well. So when you bring that together, how did you crystallize on what your strategy would be? In a sense, it was really obvious to us, even if it wasn't super obvious to everyone else in sort of the 2013-14 period. And what was obvious to us is, again, that all software would become intelligent. And that is, we're moving from computers that are just quick calculators, basically, to computers that help you make a decision. Like they make a prediction and that prediction can help you decide on something. And to us, it was really obvious because we'd all been in the technology industry for a couple of decades each at that point. And everything from Mark working in that Stanford AI lab in the early 80s to me working on a big data company in like 2010 to Jocelyn working at Facebook when they were just putting machine learning into the newsfeed to rank it better. We'd all seen the start of this. Taking a step away from our own experience, that was a really interesting time, 2013-14, because that's when this neural network revolution started. And that is, we were finally at the point where we'd had some research breakthroughs into how neural networks work. We had enough data to feed these like very data-hungry machines, and we had the computing power to actually run those computations because you've got to go through so many iterations around and around and around the network to make them work. And that was a real breakthrough year, like 12, 13. And we thought, okay, now is actually the time to go for it and just completely focus on companies working on this sort of technology. There's so many different layers to this concept of like artificial intelligence, sort of smart computers. But if you go back and say people's general understanding of like what does artificial intelligence mean? How do you track that through where we are today? Yeah, that's a really good question because everyone's talking about it. But like, what does it mean in terms of who's adopting it and why is really important as an investor? Because, you know, we're not paid to just invest in science projects. We're paid to invest in solutions that have a market. And so I think the way we frame it up that people get or find most useful is in terms of a risk curve. So that is... How has the risk of adopting artificial intelligence technologies changed over time as the technologies evolved? And the starting point of our risk curve is what we call the personalization era. And this is where most normal people started having exposure to AI, whether they knew it or not. This was about 10, 15 years ago when Netflix, Amazon, Google started to use artificial intelligence to make better recommendations and personalize their products for you. And... The risk of doing that, bringing it back to this risk curve concept, was really low, right? Like if Google just gives you a search result that's not very good, you just ignore it. Or if Amazon gives you a book recommendation that is a bit weird, you maybe have a chuckle and then just get on with your shopping. So it doesn't really matter. But that's when we started getting exposed to AI. That was sort of the personalization era. As the technology got a bit better, the risk tolerance went up and we started going, okay, let's start adopting this at work. And this was sort of around 2010, 11, 12. And so we started sprinkling AI into existing enterprise software applications. So like, for example, your CRM would not just like list all of the leads you should call that day, but it would actually make a suggestion, like maybe call this lead next, not the one that's number 52 on the list, because this person tends to respond better at this time of day. And again, like that is more risky than just using it on Amazon because it's at work, but it's still not that risky because you can just ignore that recommendation. And so as the technology got better and better, now we're in this era of automation, which is we're letting artificial intelligence technologies like computer vision technologies and whatever else automate whole segments of our workflow. Now, we're not letting them completely take over. There's still a human involved, but we're letting it do things like process an insurance claim and then just have a manual review step at the very end of the process. Or we're letting it manage our inventory for us or move stuff around a warehouse using a whole ensemble of technologies. And that's the era we're really in now. So we started with personalization and consumer. We had a little bit of augmentation in enterprise software. And then now over the last couple of years, we've really been in this automation era. Now, then the question is, what's next? Like as AI gets really good, what can we do? 
And that's what we call the AI creation era, where like AIs create totally new knowledge. And what's really going to happen in that era, which we're sort of starting now, is you get an ensemble of AI techniques. So you might have like a Bayesian system and a neural network and a bunch of other stuff that work in concert together to understand a system that humans can't even understand. So the automation era is just automating something humans know how to do. But the creation era is doing something humans don't even know how to do. So think of complex systems, like think of financial markets, biological systems, climate, and think about like how humans understand those systems. It's pretty rudimentary or like we're not very good at understanding those systems, but you get an ensemble of AIs to process the huge amount of data and understand all the segments and then sort of piece it all together for us. They can generate new knowledge for us. And that's what we're really excited about next. As you framed it, the implication is also that the risk is even higher because now we're we're effectively outsourcing even decisions and actions. How do you think about that in an investment framework of what does that mean for investment risk? Yeah, this is where we bring it way back down to earth, right, which is what's our process for this. And it's really simple. Like as an investor, we're paid to do two things, technology investor – figure out if it works and is there a market for it. We figure out if it works by using our technical skills and then we figure out if there's a market for it by asking people who would buy it. And so that's how we figure it out. We just call people and we say, look, here's an experiment that this team of machine learning researchers did in the lab. They generated this prediction. It has this degree of confidence around it and this degree of accuracy. If they can deliver that to you by building a product around it and like integrating it into how you work today would that be valuable to you? And like, what would that prediction help you do? So for example, if they could predict if the production line was going to fail at this point in time, what would that be worth to you? Or if they could predict like when your inventory is going to run out, what would that be worth to you? And so we just get on the phone to dozens of customers every time we look at an opportunity and figure that out. We have different models for understanding this. In essence, most AIs today, pretty much all of them are probabilistic systems. And so they are going to be wrong some of the time. And so we consider, okay, when they are wrong, because it's inevitable, how bad will it be? And so for that reason, you know, we've stayed away from a lot of applications of current AI technologies to healthcare, because when it goes wrong, it's really catastrophic and it will go wrong. But we've moved towards a lot of applications to it in industry, like again, in manufacturing and all that sort of stuff, because you can salvage those situations pretty easily. I want to circle through and walk through the investment process from the top. So we're super interesting, the technology and what will happen. Where do you start the funnel on finding the investment opportunities that you're looking for? So we've thought a lot about how we find the absolute best companies in the world, right? Working on this AI technologies. I guess I'll hit the question we always get first, which is, okay, so you invest in AI, but do you use AI as a firm? And we actually do. We have like quite a significant data-driven sourcing effort based out of New York, our New York office here, where we get dozens and dozens of data sources. And then we put that data through at various, it's like, again, about a dozen step process, 11 step process that involves humans and machines to clean that data, augment that data, and then generate signals about who we should contact. So an example of this is three people all leave a really successful company at the same time and then are listed on an incorporation filing in Massachusetts and then publish a research paper or tweet about something and then we automatically send them an email. And this system's amazing. Like we are contacting people and they're responding and saying, how did you even know we've started a company? No one's talked to us yet. We didn't even tell our mom. So we do use our own sort of data-driven methods to find companies. And the goal there is not like to save us work. It's to get to know people earlier so that we have time to really understand them and who they are and their motivations, but also help them run through their machine learning experiments, put them in front of customers and just get a bit of time before there's a frenzy of other investors and whatever else. And then you push into making suboptimal decisions. So we do that. Another way we find companies is through content. And we've been investing in this AI thing for a while now. And we've actually learned a lot of very good 
practical lessons about how you execute on data strategy. So there's so many different topics here, but everything from hiring machine learning engineers, managing a team of them, what does data product management mean and how does it differ from product management, finding data sources, all the weird and wonderful ways to find data, public data, private data, forming partnerships with others, how to do deals with your customers such that you have like fair data sharing between your customers, dealing with regulators. There are all these things about running a data strategy that are very different from just running a normal company strategy. And so we've written this big AI playbook about it and we publish some of that stuff and people contact us. The final way in which we find companies is just by being in the right places. And so we're really a global AI fund. And what that means is we focus on the five biggest centers of AI research. So you've got the West Coast, the East Coast, Toronto, Montreal, London, and Zurich. And MIT, East Coast, home of AI. My partner Mark's been on the board there for 15 years. And we cover NYU and Cornell from this New York office here. So that's a really important area for AI research. Stanford, obviously, leading institution in many ways. Jocelyn teaches there. And then we cover all the big tech companies from the West Coast office. Toronto is really important. I mean, they really sparked this neural network revolution like six, seven years ago now. So we spent a bunch of time there. And then Europe's really interesting, right? There's more AI research coming out of Europe than anywhere in the world, more than the US, more than China. The particular places in Europe? Yeah. So you think about the triangle of Cambridge, Oxford, London, you've got UCL, um, Imperial and whatnot. And you've also got DeepMind there and a bunch of big companies have their research offices there. But then you've also got Zurich and Munich and some of the best NLP and computer vision people in the world come out of institutions there. So that's a really exciting area. And just to wrap this up, I used to think that geographic advantage in sourcing is like one of the most unsustainable things because anyone can just get on a plane and be somewhere. But it just constantly surprises me that just being in these centers and being able to have conversations at the level these researchers want to have allows you to see these companies before anyone else. And yeah, it's been a really good thing for us to just be in the right places and focus there. As you start to sort of winnow down all the opportunities that come your way through data, through your relationships, how do you think about these companies? Are, are you looking at products? Are you looking at the people? Everything, right? We look at everything. I guess the thing that we really focus on in our process that is additive to what a lot of other firms who are not as focused on this area would have in their process is, you know, the does it work question is a bit different when you're looking at a machine learning based product as opposed to just a normal software product. You know, with a normal software product, the does it work question is, all right, can they build these features that they say they're going to build that customers want? Yeah, that's relatively straightforward in 2019. The does it work question for us involves us really digging into the data that they've got and the machine learning experiments that they've run to figure out can they get to a degree of accuracy that is meaningful for customers. And it's sort of funny, if you think about what we do, a lot of later stage investors, like value investors, think that this VC world is like completely different from what they do. But you could actually think of what we do as value investing in a way, because what we do is we price the risk that a company can actually generate this really valuable prediction. And when we meet a company, they're probably at 30 to 50% accuracy on a model, which means they can just totally simplify it. They can only automate 30 to 50% of their work, which means their gross margins are probably like 50%. But if we can see a tractable path to getting that accuracy up, therefore getting that automation up, we can see a path to getting the gross margin up, which means the company will be valued more. And so what we do is we price that risk and we invest at a certain valuation. They get all of those things up and then the company has a different valuation and that delta is what we make. I'm struggling a little bit on what these companies look like because yeah. you sort of mentioned, hey, they have a, a model that's got a certain prediction. Yeah. What stage are these businesses in when you tend to invest? They're usually a couple of people. So the founders, usually one comes from the research world and another comes from the domain they're applying that research to. And then a couple of engineers and that's it. They're usually five to 10 people or something like that. What they've done at that point is they've probably collected some data. So let's just sort of bring it down to a real example. So let's just say... The very first investment I made for Zeta, and it's a really good one because it's pretty easy to understand. 
they are trying to automate the processing of car insurance claims. And so they had collected a bunch of images of cars that had been in fender benders and broken apart. And so they've usually collected some data and then they've run that data through a model, in this case, a computer vision model, to make a prediction. So to see if that model could identify if a fender was broken and if it should be repaired or completely replaced. And then they obviously had ground truth data by talking to a loss adjuster. And so when we met them, it was a researcher and then someone who was out on the road meeting insurance companies. They had collected a bunch of images and then they'd run an experiment. And that's what it looks like when we meet them. And so then we were able to take the results of that experiment, go talk to a few insurance companies and say, okay, if we're able to automate this recognition of damage in, just from an image, how much money would that save you? And they were able to really clearly articulate to us, oh, our current loss adjusters cost us this much. This is how many claims they process. And if you could either speed this up or remove this step, we would save this much per claim. We would save $30 per claim. And we do a million claims per year. So you'd make us 30 million bucks and we'll give you 10% of that. In a lot of the evaluation of venture capital, there's a product, there's a lot of emphasis on the team. And whether that team can recruit the right people and build out the product. In this more data-driven world, it seems like so much of the success is going to be tied to the model. How important are the people and their ability to build around it compared to just the success of the model? Oh, super important. So what's happening in the machine learning world is a lot of people are using the very, very good tools provided by Google and Amazon and all these other companies to sort of take a model off the shelf, feed it a bunch of data and generate a prediction. And that for a lot of problems can get you pretty far, right? Like if the Typical example is like to figure out if there's a cat in a photo. Those models are really good. But the reality is once you get to like a specific industry problem, like is the bottle cap too big for the bottle on this production line? Like did the plastic extrusion process not work properly? You can't sort of use off-the-shelf models to do that. And so what you need to do is you need to start tuning those models. And to tune a model, you need to know how it works. You can't tune an engine without having ever rebuilt an engine, a car engine. And so the people are really important because we need to invest in people that understand the fundamentals of how this stuff works. And those people need to have the right backgrounds and need to have done the right research and need to have the domain expertise too to know what they're even trying to predict. Otherwise, they can just run expensive experiments all day long. So, yeah, it's absolutely important at the stage at which we invest. Once the model's humming, once it's generating predictions at a really high degree of accuracy, then, yeah, it's much more about the go-to-market team and the other side of the team. But when we invest, it's the tech part of the team. And how do you do the due diligence on this key question of they have a model that's 30 to 50% accurate and needs to get higher? There's no cheating here. You've got to dig into the data and you've got to dig into the model. And so... Step one is, do they have valuable data? And we have a bunch of different ways we evaluate this, but in a conceptual sense, is the data unique? Was it really hard to get that data? If it was hard to get, it it might be valuable. Is that data perishable? Does it disappear? Or does it lose relevance over time, like financial data does, for example? Is that data highly dimensional? Do you have one attribute on a person in their customer record? Like, do you just know their male or female? Or do you know their demographic and their age and all this sort of stuff as well, in which case it's probably more useful? And is it broad? So do you have a broad sample of the population or do you just have a data sample that's like a very narrow set, which you could do less with? So step one is evaluating the data. Is it valuable? And then we start evaluating the model. And so we use all the usual scores and whatnot you use to measure machine learning models, F1 scores, like precision recall and all that sort of stuff. But we try to bring it back to what it means for a customer. So for some customers, for example, in medical applications, if the model is not 100% accurate, it's useless to them. It has to be really, really accurate. But for other customers like someone running a sandwich shop who needs to know when they're going to run out of sandwiches, If it's like 20% off on a given day, it's not a big deal because that's way better than what they have right now. Like most days, they're 50, 80% off. 
And so working out what that minimum, we call it the minimum algorithmic performance, but essentially like what accuracy a customer needs for it to be valuable to them is one thing. And then how far away is the company from achieving that? Because, you know, when we meet these companies, they'll be like, okay, we know the customer needs 70% accuracy. We're at 55 today. And so we ask them, all right, well, if you have more a higher volume of data, will that increase the accuracy? Let's like run a little bit of experiment there and try to extrapolate from that. Or do you need a different type of data? Or do you need to re-engineer the model to have different predictive features in it? Or do you just need more time? Or are you actually just solving the wrong prediction problem? Do you need to go back to your customers and rework it? So we meet a company when they're not all the way there. And we try to figure out, okay, how do you get there? And how can we mitigate the risk of you actually getting to that level where it's really useful to a customer? So yeah, there's no way of cheating it. And you just have to go into all the detail of the data and the experiments they're running and sort of try to map that to customers and figure out what's going to make up that gap. And as we stand today, are there industries that this type of model and this type of research works better than others? Yeah, it's really hard to say, right? Because there are just so many things out there to automate. There are so many problems to solve. I guess using some of our frameworks, you want to work in industries where the payoff is really high. So I think of like convex and concave payoffs where if you get it right, it's really valuable to you. But if you get it wrong, it doesn't really matter. So again, going back to medical use cases, if you get it right, okay, people say, thanks, I'm out. I'll check out a hospital now. If you get it wrong, someone dies. Thinking about sales and marketing use cases, if you get it wrong, it doesn't really matter. People waste a bit of time. If you get it right, that's a new sale and that's some cash in your pocket. Same with financial markets. Like if you get it right, it's cash in your pocket. If you get it wrong, all right, whatever, we're doing another trade in another microsecond. So we think about industries where that have that very convex payoff curve from using technology. We also think about industries where there's an abundance of data. And then we also think about the complexity of the problem. So the reality is as much as we're excited about this era of AI creating new knowledge and ensembles of models, understanding complex systems, for the most part, we're pretty far away from that. And the reality is a lot of AIs are like fairly simple statistical models that extrapolate stuff in like a slightly advanced way. And so we think of industries where like that will help a lot. We're just like sifting through a lot of data automatically will yield a good return rather than, or where the problem is like a very discrete problem rather than something that's like quite unconstrained, like will it rain in 345 days? That's really hard to understand. We just don't even know. As you go through your due diligence process, broadly speaking, do you prefer the sort of consumer-facing businesses or B2B businesses? Yeah, actually, we don't work on consumer-facing stuff at all. That's partly a function of our experience. We've all worked in B2B businesses. We our experience with things like hiring your first salesperson, spending your first 50K on marketing sensibly, building your first customer success team. So in terms of how we help companies, we're just more experienced there. But also for me personally, and this is just speaking for myself, there's a sort of an intellectual integrity question here as well, which is I think B2B investing is a little bit more scientific than artistic. And that is while it's not perfect, we're able to say, look, his product and put it in front of a customer and ask that customer, is it useful? Will you buy it? When? How much will you pay? Who has to sign off on it? And therefore, we can sort of make some connections between our analysis and revenue in a pretty straightforward way. And so when I'm investing someone else's money for the most part, I want to be pretty sure or like have a high degree of intellectual integrity around that process of investing. And I've just found personally, given my experience, I'm able to do that much more in B2B. Now, when you guys get together and you've done your work, you're excited, you think there's a future here, how do you make a decision as a team? It's always changing. We're always trying to improve on this process. But it starts with this first meeting. And so at Zeta, if you meet a company, you have to decide whether to have them meet someone else on the team or pass on the opportunity after the first meeting. We found this is a really good process or a very good rule, I guess, because it forces us to formulate the gating questions about the market and technology right up front. 
It also gets everyone exposure to the company really early. And so they can just start background processing it. It exposes the team to just more opportunities and trends and whatever else. And finally, and most importantly, it means we don't waste an entrepreneur's time. So we have that after the first meetings. And then, so if you do want to move it forward, you go into that second meeting with a set of questions that the whole team has brought up. And these are the gating questions about the market or the technology. Like, what do we really need to know to invest? And so you can have a very focused second meeting. And then that set of question turns into a diligence plan, which is, okay, in the rest of our diligence process, what do we have to answer? Do we need to know, for example, is there enough budget or how long are the sales cycles for this product? Or are they able to get more of this to certain type of data? Or is that source of data exhausted? Or can they refresh that data every 30 days? Or is there just sort of a one and done thing? So it turns into a diligence plan. And then that forms the skeleton for the investment memo. So that's roughly how it works, I guess, temporarily. You mentioned a memo. So are you writing these up before you'll invest? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Our memos are quite lengthy. I think the interesting thing, and this has been uh, something that I'm a bit of a stickler for, is our memos start as a blank page. And we try not to use templates because I think templates form your thinking. And so you start with a blank page and you just start writing your recommendation. And someone should be able to read that memo from like totally cold and fully understand the opportunity, the opportunity in the market, who's on the team and all that sort of stuff. And we have some sections that are consistent between memos. Like invariably, we always have a section on the competitive advantage the company could build and compound by looping customer feedback data through the machine learning system to generate a prediction that gets better and better over time. That's obviously a core part of what we try to understand and the the type of competitive advantage we try to understand better than others. So that's consistent across memos. But yeah, we start with a blank slate. And that sounds like a lot of work. But again, going back to what I was just saying about our diligence process, we really start writing the skeleton for the memo after the first meeting by writing up that initial list of questions. So once the memo's done... Who pulls the trigger internally? Oh, we're super collaborative. Like everyone at Zeta just has an equal say really in what investments we make and we all just eventually get on board and we get to a good point of, I wouldn't call it consensus because there's just a lot of debate throughout the process, but yeah. Once you start actually writing this memo, have you had examples that countered confirmation bias where you wrote the memo and then ultimately walked away from it of your own volition. Oh, we have almost more of them than actually making the investment. Really? Yeah, very often. I mean, this is what's great about starting with a blank piece of paper. You've got to be honest with yourself first. <laughs> like, firstly, do I even have the activation energy to write this memo? Because if I don't have the activation energy to write the memo, am I going to want to turn up to board meetings on like a six-hour flight away every month? Am I going to want to get on the phone to the founder at 2 a.m. in the morning? So one, it's just like feeling of being honest with yourself. But then there's the intellectual honesty of being able to properly articulate the dynamics of the business. Like how do they make money? How does this machine learning system work? Why is this the right team? So yeah, we often start writing memos and someone will start writing a memo and then just stop. And this is after doing a bunch of research and whatever else and doing a whole lot of work. And often we'll get to the very end of the process and we'll, write up the memo and someone will have a question about like, well, you know, they're at this margin today and they think they can automate this step, but I don't think they can because I worked on this problem before and I realized that we couldn't actually solve that machine learning problem. You're like, oh, wow. Well, if that's true, I thought they could do it. I had made an assumption there. And if that assumption is wrong, this company is going to be stuck at 30% margins forever, which is not the sort of business we invest in. So, yeah, very often. And I guess this is like something you just have to love as an investor, which is you just got to love the process and you've got to love learning. And there really is no wasted learning opportunity or no process is a waste because you're always learning about a new industry, a new type of technology, you're meeting great people. And you know, if you don't make an investment at the end, that's okay. Like we don't have to do everything. We just have to do a couple of really good things. What's the competitive environment like for your focus on these types of deals? Yeah, I sort of say something internally, which is not often the most helpful thing to say, which is as soon as you're competing, you're losing. And so we try to 
in various ways by using this data-driven sourcing I talked about, by having all this content out there so people contact us, and by just being in these geographies that people aren't in. We try to be there first, and we try to be there first so that we're not under pressure to develop a relationship with a founder on like an artificial timeline. And we just have time to get to know each other. And that means that I can honestly say most of the situations we get into are not competitive, but the market's relatively efficient in some parts of the world and with some types of technology and some companies. So a lot of people are thinking about AI and the opportunity here. It's somewhat obvious now. So yeah, you get into competitive situations here and there. And that's when the sort of how do you help question really comes to the fore. And that's when we bring forward a lot of this stuff around. Well, you know, we've helped companies building AI systems before and we've learned this and we can put you in touch with this person or this researcher that's worked on this problem before. Or we actually met a company three years ago that has a data set that you need. And so that's when the how do you help question really comes in and your experience comes to the fore. When you're running into a knowingly competitive situation and you're still working through the sort of later stages of your diligence, where does the rubber meet the road on what you're willing to sacrifice in making those trade-offs? I think where the rubber meets the road is less sleep. (laughs) So you just have to get the same amount of work done in less time. I guess there's also inherent uncertainty at our stage, right? Like if we're intellectually honest, there are so many things that are unknown at the point at which we invest such that you can't do that much work at the end of the day to really know that much more. And so it's not unfeasible to run our whole process in a matter of days. And we've done that many times to know as much as we possibly can. Things we won't sacrifice on, for example, getting customer feedback. If we just can't get on the phone to someone who say, if you build it, I will buy it, then we can't rely on our own judgment there, right? Like we're not the buyer at the end of the day and we can't say, I think they'll buy it because that's that's baseless. And that's like a key risk that we're paid to mitigate and price. And what's happened in the inevitable situation where you love the technology and you're not sure the people are the right people to pull it off. You can think of a few different options there. Like you can think of, well, how could I augment this team and who could we help them hire? You can think about like how to rework the team. You can think about all those sorts of things. I think mostly at our stage of investing, the founders are everything. They're the driving force of the culture and the product and whatnot. So if they're not right, they're not right. We just move on. We move on to the next opportunity. And, you know, not right doesn't mean that they're not going to be successful. It's just like, yeah, our opinion is such that we don't know that they can pull off the idea that they're working on right now, or maybe they can pull off the next idea. I don't know. Or we just don't bond very well, or whatever. And again, like we don't have to work with everyone in the world. We just have to help a small amount of companies do really great things. How do you work with the companies once you've made an investment? We do all the usual things that a lot of early stage venture funds do. So we'll help you get to market. You know, really, that's what classic venture capital is. It's you've got a technology and you've got to take it to market and we'll give you a couple of million bucks and we'll work hard with you to get it out there and get you to your first couple of customers and your first million dollars in revenue and that sort of thing. And so to do that, you got to hire a salesperson and hiring your first salesperson is really tough. How do you compensate them? What's a good personality for this product? You know, spending 50K on marketing so people even know who you are, figuring out product roadmaps. You know, we help with all that sort of stuff. The thing we do that founders tell us and the market tells us is a little bit different from everyone else is really help with data strategy. And that goes back to a couple of things I was saying before, like helping companies find sources of data, convince their customers to work with them and share data and create like data coalitions, data product management and thinking about how they can collect design features to collect more data, really executing on that data strategy and marketing the benefit of this predictive system. Marketing a product that delivers a prediction is very different to marketing a product based on like a feature list. So that's where we help, I think, that is a little bit different to others in market. And when you put these together, how do you think about your fund level, what the portfolio looks like? Yeah, this is something that I love working on. And so we try to construct the largest portfolio we can, given that in our industry, returns follow a power law distribution. 
but we don't know up front like which companies are going to be in the tail of that, right? And the unintuitive thing about power law distributions is that your average return goes up as your points of exposure go up. And so if theoretically, you should just have make as many investments as you possibly can along that distribution or under that curve. But the reality is that we can only support 10 or so companies per partner per fund. Like our model is like really high service and high touch. So that caps your portfolio size. So you've got a capped portfolio size, say 10 companies per partner per fund or eight. Then you've got to figure out your sizing on the per slot sizing. So our sizing is based on how much we need to own of a company and how much that will cost us. So we figure out how much we need to own by starting with what's the important and immutable factor here, which is the distribution of exits in enterprise software. And so we take that distribution and we figure out how much we have to own of companies scattered across that probability distribution to return the fund three times over net of fees. And our distribution of outcomes looks very different to the markets right now, but we just start with what we base our expectations on the market in case we revert to the mean over time, which I hope we don't, in which case I should be fired. So you take the ownership you need, you figure out how much this costs in dollar terms, given like a founder's dilution preference at our stage, and then you multiply that by the portfolio size, and then you get your fund size. All right, let's walk through some numbers to get yeah. to your fund size so yeah. we understand so, how that works. Founders at the early stage typically are selling 20 to 30% of their company. And that usually costs you a couple of million dollars. So you've got a couple of million dollars to own 20% of a company, 2 million, say, times 20%. And then our portfolio size is 20 to 30 positions, so three partners, three to four partners, say 30 positions. And then you've got reserves as well to hold that ownership level. So 2 million initial check, you want to hold that ownership for right through to, in our case, the Series B, because... A lot of enterprise software companies at that point will either exit for like a nine-figure amount or they'll go all the way to IPO. So you reserve another, say, four to six million. So call that $8 million per slot. And then you have, say, 25 slots. Then you eight times 25 is your fund size. A lot of times when people think about venture capital, you think about the humongous well-known winners, the Ubers are a very different business. The numbers you're laying out to get to three times, it sounds like it's a different type of potential outcome. We're in a different game. Yeah. So, I mean, look, having a small fund gives you a lot of optionality. We have a positive impact if we support companies of consequence and we make money as those companies exit through carry. And so AUM and having these massive funds is not really something we think about in that calculus. Having a smaller fund means that we can, owning 20% of a company, we can have an exit for that company that's in the low nine figures or whatever else, have a couple of them, and we earn good money for our investors. We do our job. And so our investors don't have to hold a belief that we're extraordinary pickers that can predictably find companies in their very, very long tail of the power law distribution. We hope we do that, but they don't have to believe that up front if your fund size is smaller. What have been your favorite recent investments? Well, unfortunately, a few of them are stealth, but I'll go through some of the others. Maya was an investment we made about a year ago. And so what they're doing is they're getting all this data from various devices that you wear or in your home. So a mattress pad or a single lead EKG or a ring that tracks your activity or whatnot. And it's got all this noisy data. And then they process that using various signal processing and machine learning based methods to figure out as someone with chronic heart failure, is your condition getting better or worse? And the way you do this today the gold standard is you have this $50,000 implantable device that measures fluid levels and all sorts of stuff and the heart activity. And they're doing it passively, which is really cool. So Maya is a company that I'm really proud to support because they're developing effectively a much less invasive, more scalable and way cheaper and also more consistent way to monitor patients with chronic heart failure of which there are millions and millions in the U.S., So that's the one that I'm really excited about. We also backed a company recently that is playing in this market of food delivery and cloud kitchens, but in a way that's pure software. So as someone who grew up in an Italian family, it pains me to think that we're going into an era where no one cooks their own food, but we are. 
and delivery and various other technologies are getting so good that you click a button and you get food in 10 minutes and people love that, of course. Now, there are a couple of ways you can invest in this trend. Like you can buy real estate and rent it out to these cloud kitchens, these kitchens that just cook in one place and then distribute everything through Uber Eats. You can invest in the delivery companies or you can invest in brands or you can do all sorts of things. But what we've found is we've found this company that has built this amazing software that runs all those kitchens and allows them to figure things out like how to recombine ingredients and recipes and whatever else to have five different brands like a Mexican, Chinese, Italian or whatever brand out of the same location using the same cooks. And there's a lot of complexity in that and they figure all of that out or make sure they never run out of an ingredient. And the software you know, available to companies like that today is not equipped for this next age of like very complex supply chains and customer preferences. So I'm excited there because feeding people is important and a big market and linked to something that my family has worked on for years and I'm excited by. Yeah. In our world, in the financial services world, oh, yeah. you hear a lot about data sets that hedge funds are using and satellite images and stuff like that. Where have you seen the use of your particular area of expertise in AI on the business sense touching financial services? Yeah. It's all over. I mean, as you pointed out, hedge funds have been really at the cutting edge of this for a long time. But not just hedge funds, banks too. I mean, if you think about pricing credit, like it's a prediction problem. If you think about insurance companies, like what are they pricing? They're pricing risk and they're making predictions and they use actuaries to do that today. So there's opportunities everywhere. I mean, on the hedge fund side, it's endless because you're sort of trying to make all sorts of predictions about all sorts of behaviors in a complex system. And so what I'm excited by there is not necessarily like the next best data source because they tend to be very perishable. I'm excited about different tools for those hedge funds that are trying to make predictions in complex systems. So we've made a stealth investment in a company that's got this new tool to do simulation modeling and to simulate all these agents in a different system. So that's what I think is cool on the hedge fund side, new tools to do simulations of complex systems. On the banking side, there are just so many data sets coming online that you can use to price different types of risk. We've got all sorts of consumer behavior data from how people use their phones and how people move around and what they're buying online and this and that. And this is all new data you can use to price credit and there's a firm here in New York called CoVenture that's investing in a lot of companies in this area, but there are a lot of opportunities there. And then on the insurance side, we're actually, we probably spend most of our time, if you sort of think of fintech, again, you've got all this new data coming online that allows you to make different predictions around whether a disaster is going to happen and what damage is going to be caused by that disaster or how long people are going to live using all this healthcare data. And there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And so we work with some really big insurance companies to sort of understand what their needs are and find companies that can augment their existing predictive abilities through their actuarial models with new data and new systems that make better predictions. As you talk to people who are a little bit knowledgeable about the data, use of data and AI, are there any common misperceptions that people have that you know are wrong, but it's just what people seem to understand? Yeah. Starting in the most general sense, I think people think AI does a lot more than it actually does today. And that is, you know, it's not like really completely autonomously making all these decisions day to day, like in lots of cases. It's really just like a simple statistical extrapolation of a trend and delivering that in a report to someone. I think also people think about data volume rather than the dimensionality of data or whatnot. And often you solve really important problems with really small amounts of data. And so I think people think about volume and data is the new oil and all this sort of stuff. Like that's just not a useful analogy at all. And that's not the way to think about it. Every problem has different data requirements to solve. And you could have all the data in the world and amass all this data and not be able to predict anything because the data is just not broad or dimensional or perishes straight away. So that's another one. And then I think people are really concerned about the control that a lot of really big tech companies have over a lot of talent. Don't get me wrong, like DeepMind is an amazing institution and Google has a huge amount of talent and so does Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft and whatnot. However, one, 
I believe, and this is a personal belief, these companies are really trying to do the right thing. I also see every day people breaking off from these companies and just applying their knowledge to all sorts of other industries day to day and starting their own companies. And so the talent is like not that concentrated actually. And there are all sorts of great people all around the world breaking off and doing cool things with AI. How do your companies think about that question of the resources and power of the big tech giants from a competitive perspective? This is something that we have thought about a lot as our fund has evolved as well. You know, when we started the fund, there were very little tools for data scientists and machine learning engineers. And so we were the biggest investors in companies like Kaggle, the largest investor in Domino, another company called Bebop that sold to Google Cloud. And we invested a lot in tooling at the start of the fund. And then as we moved into the second fund, a lot of these big companies like Google released TensorFlow and Amazon released SageMaker. And they started giving away a lot of these tools which they were doing for obvious reasons because they wanted people to use their cloud to run the models once they'd built them with these tools and they could amortize the cost of their cloud and they had a just different business model everyone else. Now we're seeing just so many different ways to apply AI that we need even more tools than all these big companies can build. And so I think we're going through like a resurgence of tool building for data scientists and machine learning engineers. And if you think about it, the state of tooling for a data scientist in 2019 is what it was for a software engineer in like the late 80s, early 90s. There's still so much that's so hard about building these things that could be made a lot easier with the right tools. And so to bring it right back to the question, people who are on the ground today know that there is just so much opportunity here that the big companies, no matter how well-resourced and whatever else they are, they just can't build all these tools and build all these technologies. The other thing, I guess, just to wrap up on the big companies is they're not really structured and their businesses are so big such that it's not really worth it for them to go in and solve problems in a lot of vertical markets. So markets where the total opportunity is a couple of hundred million dollars. This just doesn't work for them. So to go in and solve the MRO inventory prediction problem for auto parts manufacturers, that's not something Google's ever going to do. And so we invest in companies that do want to do that. Yeah. So if I run my very sophisticated AI model on the future of Zeta, <laughs> what are you looking at over kind of the next five or 10 years for your business? I think fundamentally in terms of technologies like where we want to back companies that are building the tooling of the next generation and helping us sort of use computers to build more and more of these models. We're looking for companies that are moving into that AI creation phase. So companies that are building products that understand complex systems like societal systems. So systems in agriculture, climate science, biology, areas like that. And then, you know, we're looking at these companies everywhere all around the world. And so we as a team have to become more distributed and we have to be in more places to, to find people where they are. If you're building a tool to automatically run a greenhouse, well, you're going to be building that in Holland and we have to go and meet you there. Or if you're building a tool to help Red Bull manage their production line, you're going to be in Austria. Or if you're building a tool in the insurance industry, you're going to be in the middle of the US. So, you know, we're going to have to be more distributed as well to be on top of these things. All right, Ash, I want to turn to a couple of closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I really like designing bikes. And so I really enjoy studying the mechanics of handling what is the best lever we've invented to turn human effort into propulsion, and that's the bicycle. It's this sweet spot of accessible, like I don't need a mechanical engineering degree to design a bike, but also like sort of difficult as well to understand. And it sort of matches the physical with the intellectual. And don't get me wrong, I love riding bikes as well. But yeah, I, I really like that combination of like linking the physical, the biomechanics to the intellectual, like the mechanics of handling this thing. Are your bikes different from what someone might find at their local bike shop? Very different. So firstly, I don't touch carbon fiber. I don't like carbon fiber for a whole bunch of reasons. So I prefer to work with materials like steel and titanium. Secondly, like a lot of the bikes I design are like fit for a purpose. So a commuter bike is completely different from a road bike. It's 
bigger tires and like more upright and all this sort of stuff. A bike that descends really well is different to a bike that climbs really well. A bike that goes really fast on like nice long straight rides, dirt bike, non-dirt bike. So all these different bikes have different handling characteristics and every dimension of the bike, the length of the stem and the the stack height and all this stuff changes based on how you want it to handle and also who you are as a person and like what your physical attributes are and whatnot. So yeah, they're totally different. To and is this like a shop. side commercial enterprise or are you the sole customer of your bikes? I'm the sole customer of my bikes, <laughs> yes. Maybe my dad gets some side benefit from this as well. He gets to ride some of them. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? So I have a preference for avoiding jargon and I just find that like using words that other people invented or don't really know the meaning of just gets in the way of trying to understand what someone's saying so i tend to switch off in pitches where the presenters sort of use like a a word cloud of popular terms in their pitch and it's also a pretty strong sign to me that they haven't come to a fundamental understanding from something new like to explain something bottom up you have to sort of use very simple known words and sort of articulate it step by step to to get someone to understand it if it's truly novel. So yeah, using a lot of jargon in pitches is probably the one. What reading do you almost never miss? So I actually don't read anything on the regular. I prefer to just follow my curiosity down very deep rabbit holes. This is very funny to say. I haven't read the news or watched anything, any serial content since 2006. And I prefer to just sort of pick something up and if I like that area or if there's like something that's intriguing, I just follow it. And I don't have any regular source of news or or anything that I just pick up every month. How do you use social media? I don't use it mostly. Like I haven't been on Facebook for many years and on Instagram, I follow people that weld bicycles, but that's about it. (laughs) Um, Twitter and LinkedIn are, are pretty cool though. Like they do give you access to people that you wouldn't otherwise access or let you have conversations with them. So I do use Twitter and LinkedIn, but in a targeted way for work, like LinkedIn to just help our companies get messages out about what they're doing and who they're hiring and Twitter to mostly access people working in like areas of machine learning research because it's just sort of like replaced the RSS feed. It would be cool if every machine learning lab in the world had an RSS feed. That'd be great. And if Google Reader still existed, I'd probably prefer to do that, but they don't. And the proxy for that now, the way that you do that now is through Twitter. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Yeah, this is a pretty clear one. Finish the job. Whether it's mowing the lawn or the last line of the the math proof, like just finish it. And it's just something that was drilled into me as a kid. And it's actually pretty valuable. Like it's often in that last 20% that you find the novel or the new or the intriguing thing that leads you to the next area of investigation. Don't get me wrong, like having this idea in your head that you've always got to finish the job can lead to some bad habits. Like I never walk out of a movie theater, even if the movie's terrible or I finish every single book I pick up. And it means, I guess, I just have to be very clear about setting time aside to prioritize up front. All right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Bring people along for the ride. You can be brilliant and achieve the impossible quicker than anyone thought you could achieve it and sort of bulldoze your way to success really quickly. But what's the point if no one's there with you? If sort of along the way, like you've broken a bit of glass or like someone, you just haven't brought people along for the ride to celebrate it with you and to sustain it with you as well. So just bringing people along for the ride at every step and making sure that people are on board with how you're doing things such that when you get there and you achieve the goal, there are people around there with you. Ash, this is so much fun. Yeah. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. Thank you.